Good morning. This is George Pasty from Vertantis. Welcome to our webinar on transforming MRO supply chain with a focus on material master data and, in particular, indirect materials. That will be the focus of our, our webinar today. Format-wise, we do have a couple of polling questions that we'll be stopping at as we go through, and we'll greatly appreciate the participation in uh, casting your vote. And um, from there, we will have questions at the end, uh, which we encourage you to submit at any point in time, either via the comments or uh, via the, the webinar information. And we'll be happy to tackle those at the end of this or uh, in subsequent follow-on. So this is really a, a Verdantis take on, uh, you know, what we've learned over uh, over 200 client engagements and uh, processing over 100 million materials uh, in, in this space. Now, uh, just a little bit about Verdantis. What makes us different is we've de developed a set of automated technologies to deliver to deliver standardized material data as a service. Uh, so we use our technology in the background to take uh, and automate effectively, efficiently, and accurately that data, and it makes us very scalable to handle some of the largest corporations in the world. A little bit about me. Uh, my name is George Cassidy. I'm a sales manager for Bardontis. I've been here over six years. I've spent about 15 years of my career in the content and master data management space. My focus has been around materials, predominantly electrical and mechanical. And I have experience in a range of different supply chain activities and sourcing activities, as well as manufacturing and engineering uh, activities. So I, I've been doing this from a, a consulting sales perspective for a number of years, and I'm very keen to set and meet expectations. So for today's purposes, what I thought we would do is I would introduce, you know, the, the, the realm of material master data management and then uh, from the webinar perspective, you know, kind of run through uh, what it is, the areas that we're focused on, uh, what have been the historical challenges in better manage that, managing that, um, what is the effect of transforming uh, those challenges into actionable data, and what's the benefit in it for the business. So that's the flow of our webinar today. And um, that's where we'll start with the definition of what we mean by material master data management. Again, this could be direct or indirect materials. Our focus today is going to be on indirect, but MMDM, material master data management, is essentially a central repository of consolidated, standardized, normalized information around your materials at an enterprise level. Um, what it allows people to do is get uh, visibility should they require it across the enterprise for you know, procurement, uh, supply chain, uh, uh, inventory perspectives. And it, and it manages a number of uh, static data elements around what a thing is, things like part number, the noun modifier and attribution on the description, uh, commodity codes, docking codes, any kind of technical specifications. Those are the things, uh, you know, as opposed to transactional information like lead time, quantity on hand, min maxes. Those are really the realm of the transactional ERP or asset management software. MMDM is really focused in on that static what it is data. Um, so it, it's really, think of it as the fuel for any other transactional system. Uh, those transactional systems are only as good as the information that goes into them. So, Many of our clients have told us that it's key enabler uh, to realize the value out of these other systems to have solid foundational data from a materials perspective in those systems. The other data domain that Verdantis focuses in is the services data domain. And services is uh, a different animal than materials. And by way of example, um, you know, you could have the same service on a, on a, a procured versus leased piece of equipment. Um, what services have different than materials is, in materials, it's often to your advantage to have more attribution to describe the functional characteristics of a material. In services, that's not always the case. And I'll give you an example. If I have, if I'm a utility, a national-wide utility, and I have a trenching service, 
and those are a regional supplier of this service. I don't care the last dimensions of the ditch they dug for me. I just need to be pointed towards the right service provider for my region. So in that case, that additional attribution, if you will, depth, width, height, length, uh, is not important because my ditch is going to be different. So uh, services are a service by each basis, and we work with our clients into um, uh, you know, working out with the best level of granularity to describe that service, to drive that value. So uh, we focus in that area as well. And so interestingly, many of our clients will spend more on services than they do on MRO or indirect materials. So it really breaks down into two key functional areas when we talk about material master data, uh, data management. It really comes down into the cleansing and the ongoing governance, or as Vergantis calls it, get it clean and keep it clean. And uh, the get it clean piece is, again, where we formed the business, uh, where we developed our proprietary technologies, and it was really about the area of cleansing and deduplicating data for our clients. Uh, providing back a consistent, granular, normalized view of their materials, complete with taxonomies and separately fielded attributes if required. Uh, it helps deliver uh, an increase in throughput uh, by being able to deliver it quickly, accurately, and economically, um, which is, which is, by the way, an Achilles heel on a lot of data projects is time. So the ability to deliver it quickly and then realize the value is often key, especially on large projects where you could be talking about a year plus to deliver the data. Um, then there's the part of now that I've got it clean, how do I keep it clean? And this is the area of data governance for us. That's our integrity platform. Um, this is how I make sure that I adhere to my data standards going forward with as few resources as possible through an automated process that will drive behaviors. Um, so. I think we've done a good job, and if you're interested later, I can show you uh, at your convenience um, that we've created a very easy-to-use system that keep, creates a lot of the complexity and automation insulated from the end user so that uh, it will automatically do things like fill in commodity codes or material codes, uh, guide, guide the end user towards the correct attribute usage, things like that. And we do that through artificial intelligence, fuzzy logic capability, things like that, um, to be able to, to make that behavior as easy to adhere to as possible. So just in a nutshell, material master data management initiatives, when you're transforming your data, really bake down into get it clean and keep it clean. Now, with, with, with Don, as I said, you know, we're a little bit different in that we've developed uh, technology. So from our perspective, you know, for a, a, a domain niche provider for us around materials and services, we're able to scale to handle some of the largest companies in the world. Uh, and we do that by automating as much as we can automate in the process. And we've created four kernels of technology that are proprietary to Verdantis, a high-speed classification engine called AutoClass that tells us what the material is. Uh, once we know what it is, we can tag it to a specification template. We've got 3,700 out of the box, and they're highly configurable. Once we do that, we can engage that specific set of our auto spec code, which is, again, the, a closed loop, learn by example, artificial intelligence-based uh, engine that deconstructs those legacy descriptions and populates those specification templates at the first pass on normalizing that data and standardizing that data. Uh, once we've got that data separately, uh, separately fielded, we can see what data elements are missing. Uh, we can also normalize that data with our auto normalization tool, which is a high-speed normalization tool. And once we know what attribution is missing, we can engage our auto rich tool, uh, which is called auto crawl. And it's a web spidering technology that will go out and in a source missing attribution information from your legacy description to give you a more robust final result. So with integrity, that, that was the get it clean piece. That's the harmonized platform. The integrity platform has to be an easy to use tool. This has to be the type of tool that somebody with gloves on out in the field can take their gloves off after not using the system for three weeks and walk up and find what they're looking for. 
So search, find, and compare, we've done a very good job of making it uh, very easy to use. We have several different ways of search from everything like Google level searching down to parametric drill down. Um, but the idea, again, is that I can walk away from this and I can walk back up to it and be very effective. On the back end, we've got robust workflows for the data stewardship and governance. And of course, uh, reporting technologies and you know, uh, user administration dashboards, et cetera. Secondly, this has to be the tool that ensures compliance. This is how you make sure your data does not degrade over time. So this is where, where you will be maintaining your data standards for any new material request. Now, with integrity, we've built in functionality so that you cannot request a material that is a duplicate. So any new material request, should you have the permissions to request a new material, uh, will be a unique material to the organization. And that new unique material to the organization will adhere to the data dictionary standards as adopted by the organization. So that's how we help ensure compliance. And then we've developed a single repository. This is where you have the actionable data at a granular consolidated view across your organization that allows you to do things like deduplicate, better leverage spend, drive more on contract spend, and things we'll talk about more in the business case. So what is MRO? And I know many organizations design uh, define it differently. I mean, it can mean different things to different people. It can include capital spares, insurance spares, uh, consumables, uh, industrial equipment, uh, that can include facilities, IT assets, uh, things that you, uh, you know, are, are, are functional assemblies like industrial equipment or are single use items like uh, supplies, uh, as well as, you know, consumable safety gear, things like that. So really thinking of it as any indirect material pretty much. And how does that fit in with supply chain? Well, supply chain obviously goes across direct, indirect uh, services, et cetera, anything that's being sourced by the organization and has to be at some place at some time to, to deliver a product. Now, that, that being at some place at some time, the right time, right part, uh, can be both from a production perspective on an on a end use product or from an asset perspective to keep that, that, that production process in, you know, up and running. So, the supply chain is really about getting the right part to the right place at the right time efficiently and at the lowest cost. Uh, that's really what it comes down to. So many organizations have spent a lot of time on the supply chain, particularly around direct materials, because it typically constitutes the highest percentage of material spend in the organization. Um, whereas the indirect materials, and we'll talk about this in more detail as we get further into the uh, presentation, is an area that has not had as much attention. Um, but when we talk about materials management uh, within the supply chain organization, they're really the folks that are, that are, that are tasked with uh, not only the static definition of the materials, but also the dynamic or transactional information around those materials. You know, uh, quantity on hand, uh, lead times, uh, min-maxes, um, being able to uh, communicate those those needs across uh, the various points of operation in the organization. So uh, supply chain is really that core activities from sourcing the materials to having the materials available to the people who need it, be it either from a direct or indirect materials. And again, we're going to be focusing more on indirect for the purposes of this presentation. So why is MRO important? I mean, there's obvious questions come to come to mind that, you know, if I don't have the right part at the right time, my line goes down. Um, so, what a lot of organizations that don't diligently maintain their MRO inventory do is they overstock everything just to make sure the line never goes down, which is not optimized, right? We all know that. Um, so, by optimizing your inventory and better analytics around, you know, duplication and those types of things, really allow you to stock the right part in the right location on an as-needed uh, as basis uh, for both planned and unplanned uh, maintenance activities. Now, one of the reasons that second bullet is so true on water savings is, you know, just typically speaking, depending on your industry, this can vary greatly. But if you're looking at, say, 15% of your total spend going into indirect materials, 
and you look at the volume of different material types that go into your direct versus indirect, it's often several orders of magnitude, if not hundreds of orders of magnitude, more, more material types in MRO than there are in direct materials, which makes it much more difficult to manage. So historically, many organizations have, uh, I won't say turned a blind eye, but maybe not focused as intently on optimizing their MRO inventories because its percentage of, percentage of spend overall is lower. So what we have found is that that leads to a large opportunity for savings in that 15 or so percent of spend that goes into those indirect materials. Uh, in many cases, into into solid double-digit returns, whereas the direct materials have been worked over fairly diligently for a long time, in some cases 30 years. And, you know, trying to squeak another 1% or 2% out of that can be difficult. That's not true in most organizations for MRO. Um, so that's why I think that second bullet is, is so important. So why haven't more organizations done it? Well, one of the aforementioned challenges is the breadth and range of materials and the highly technical uh, challenges in converting that into meaningful, actionable business intelligence is very difficult, and many organizations don't have the resources to do it. So uh, that's why they have it. That's why organizations like us exist. Uh, one of those challenges in getting that actionable data is if you're like many of our organizations, uh, you have either diverse platforms, you know, multiple ERPs or asset management software, which make, you know, rolling up that data very difficult, or you've grown through acquisition, which means you've onboarded different data standards into the same material master, again, making rolling up those like parts very difficult. Um, so that's been a historical challenge. really comes down to uh, the complexities of getting that view and not having the, the maybe the, the knowledge, resources, and time to do it internally. So how did we get here? Well, one of the most common reasons I see, well, I should say we see, is that historically organizations have not had strong governance. Uh, and if they have, it's, it's traditionally been at a BU level. So what does that mean? That means if I don't have strong governance and I have a free-for-all on ERP access and I'm using free-form text descriptions to request new materials, I have a lot of people entering material descriptions for the same material that are very different. I will describe a bolt differently than you will. And unless I have some guidance in place on the correct down modifier and attribution to use for that, mine will be different from yours. And when I go back to look for it, I won't find yours. So that has been one of the uh, primary uh, reasons for uh, the resulting situation that, that people are in today, where they have you know, multiple internal part numbers assigned to effectively the same part across the organization. Um, one of the things that compounds is that you just don't have the resources to do the governance. And those that do are typically overwhelmed when you have uh, you know, staff of two, three, four, maybe five people trying to field hundreds of requests, they just can't keep up with it. So by automating that to workflows, you can make a much smaller team much more effective in terms of handling enterprise-wide material workflows uh, for both edits and requests of new materials. Another key driver has been that lack of standards adaptation by our, our clients. So they, they don't have preferred corporate data dictionaries on how to describe a material across the organization. So again, combined with the free form text fields and a lack of standards, people are entering materials uh, you know, as they see ad hoc. And one of the most important and I think critical components of any governance and data cleansing operation is executive sponsorship. So without that, I mean, you're really talking, uh, you know, cultural change on how you do business in an MRO transformation project such as this. And, you know, the old adage of people, process, and technology holds true. And that people and process piece 
you know, we've got the engagement process methodology uh, nailed down, um, but our clients also do need to engage in the cultural shift and dedicate resources, particularly on their ongoing governance, to make this effective. And that only happens with executive sponsorship. So what kind of challenges do your client, do my clients see uh, based on the fact that they, they've kind of, uh, you know, swept the, the governance and cleansing of MRO data under the rug? Well, you know, they, they run into all kinds of problems like uh, false stockouts. You know, I have a line down situation. I have the part stock, but do I look at the bill of material? I have an internal part number that's not in stock. Little do I know I have a functionally equivalent part in another bin. But because my descriptions are so different, I can't see that part. And who know how long I'm down for? And if I have to expedite that part at additional part costs and rate costs, um, you know, it, it prevents me from being able to find parts for things like preventive maintenance. Um, you know, two things happen when I can't find a part. Uh, I either request a duplicate or I spend days looking for it. So I get very frustrated people uh, using the system. And I'm leaving a lot of value on the table. And we'll talk more about that in the value proposition section of this uh, presentation. So that leads us to our first poll question. If you could take a first uh, a couple of seconds and respond to this, I'd greatly appreciate it. We'll give you 15 or so seconds to uh, just take a quick look at, and log your votes. Okay, we're going to move on at this point. I hope you both cast your votes. So now we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, what are some of the um, the keys around transforming your MRO supply chain? So number one is a strategy, right? I mean, you know, why am I doing this? What am I doing it for? Who are the people responsible for helping me do this? What do I hope them the outcomes are? Uh, can I quantify my expected value? Um, those types of things about developing that strategy and what my expected outcomes are and then tying together the resources to make that happen. So break, we find it very helpful to break that down into the historical data cleansing perspective. That's typically a one and done. Batch in, batch out, data cleansing. Uh, we structure our engagement methodology to minimize the resources required by our clients and we find that to be critical to uh, enabling uh, a quick and accurate delivery of data. Uh, we don't want it, uh, you to be the bottleneck, right? So uh, we, we recognize that you have other jobs, so we will tap into your resources as little as possible. Then the second part is the ongoing data uh, maintenance. And that's, that's the journey part of it, right? That's not a one and done. This is how am I going to, you know, do my day-to-day -to, -day to maintain my cleanse data going forward so that I can year over year realize these value benefits that I'm trying to achieve. So when we look at the two components, um, we, we're really looking at uh, what are my target materials for classification and attribution. Uh, almost all of our clients do some level of triage on what materials are of value enough to the organization to constitute uh, going through the cleansing process. And that triage will include things like, um, is, it, is, this, is this material tied to an asset? Has it been issued in the last three years? Is it worth more than X in dollar value? Those, you know, how much of my annual turn does it constitute? So by applying these kind of metrics, uh, our clients will often whittle down their historical data volumes by 10 or 20, sometimes up to 40 percent of what they actually care about cleansing because they're getting rid of parts they don't care about. They were either one-off, they're obsolete, et cetera. So that's a very important component part of the historical data cleansing process. And then there's the governance process uh, to ensure that enterprise-wide uh, visibility into your MRO to provide the most efficient uh, you know, an optimal 
way of rationalizing and managing your, your existing inventories and future inventories. So creating a framework by which this will happen for the search, find, compare, and request, and then the ongoing governance is critical to making sure that you don't uh, degrade your data over time from those previous mentioned causes of freeform text lack of governance. Uh, interestingly, some of our earlier clients found that if they did not have governance in place and they were requesting new materials through, you know, a, 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 a not optimal process of freeform text and no governance, they were seeing their data degrade by 15, sometimes 20 percent a year. So if you do the math, you know, that means in three years, I might have to cleanse 50 percent of my data again. So that's really why governance is so important is that you, you don't just have a, a, a one-and-done value proposition. You have the one-and-done data cleansing, but then you have the ongoing value realization over time. So overall, we're talking about improved performance. We're talking about reduced carrying costs. We're talking about building on your sourcing strategies. And what I mean by that is almost all of my clients have done some level of categorization of their spend. And they'll, they're more than eager to tell me how much they spend on powertrain, but they can't tell me how much they spend on 100 horsepower J frame, 240 volt explosion proof 100 horsepower motors. And that's the difference by being able to take that level of granularity and then overlay your transactional information on that and say a BI engine and be able to slice and dice your data down to that level of granularity opens up a whole new wor world of spend leverage that. Uh, a lot of our more mature customers are really enjoying. Um, the other is enterprise visibility. I got a plant down situation. I'm looking for a part. How come I don't have visibility into other regional uh, storerooms that, that may have that part that I'm looking for? So to be able to request, extend, and ship that part into my, into my plant uh, is key for this uh, uh, risk mitigation. Also, inventory uh, optimization, uh, being able to uh, streamline my operations, uh, will give me increased productivity and customer satisfaction. So let's talk about the actual value. Um, what, what we see, and here's a client example, steel manufacturer. Um, they're one of our uh, earlier customers. I'm going to say this job was done about eight years ago, but they gave them a chance to quantify some of the value buckets that they were interested in. Uh, and these vary by company depending on what their uh, that, you know, their, their initiative du jour is. Uh, but the profile of them, they about an $8 billion annual revenue turn at the time. About $1 billion of that was spent on MRO. Uh, they carried $400 million in inventory value. Um, their initial MRO count from consolidating of legacy systems was approximately 400,000 items. So the first thing we did is we harmonized their data and helped them do that triage that I talked about. And, and that, that initial pass at their data was helped us identify uh, 60,000 parts that were the actual unique items. And include that, included in that was a 15% part, a 15% reduction in total SKUs and the identification at 10% in duplicates. So when we start quantifying that. And the way they quantified it is they wanted to look at reductions in carrying costs. Some of my clients like to put in overhead on this. Um, they did not. Overhead will bump this number sometimes substantially as, as a, a write-down factor in terms of the overall savings potential. So in their case, um, by reducing 10% of that duplication of the 400 million they were carrying, they were able to realize by their calculations a 4.4% reduction on that 40 million. So now in one, in that one bucket more than paid for the project. Uh, and in that case, it was $1.7 million. And that's a savings that's going to recur every year. So for as long as I am diligent about my data and I stay on top of duplicate in the introduction through a, a, a solid stewardship program and governance program, I will realize that savings every year. So the other area is that more granular view of aggregation that I talked about. And in their case, 
of the one billion, they found that about 15% were very functionally similar, and that was across about 10% of their supply base. So, in terms of their spend, 15% of one billion, that's 150 million of addressable spend by being able to consolidate similar parts into a like supplier. They were able to reduce their cost by 12.5% on that $150 million, which reduced an $18 million savings. So again, this is this is a this is a savings that they're going to realize year over year. So from a governance perspective, one of the key areas that they were looking into is the area of off contract or maverick spend. So this so I can't find a part, if I have to expedite a part, I'm buying it, you know, off a P card or something like that. I am not buying it off a preferred contract or a PVA with one of my known suppliers. In AK's case, they had about 80% of their one billion in MRO spend under contract from preferred suppliers with pre-negotiated contracts. So they had a potential there to spend eight hundred million dollars uh, against preferred contracts. But but in actuality, um, they, about 80%, eight, that, of that 80% potential, 40% was off contract. So that means people could not find a thing. By being able to provide clean, consistent descriptions, they were within a, a 12 to 18-month program able to in, reduce that to 25%. So that 15% gain in compliance uh, of material spend uh, against $120 million in contracted spending reduced that spend by 16.5% based on their calculations. If you talk to the gardeners of the world, they'll tell you that's a little bit more than 18%. So that's a little bit of a conservative number. Uh, by driving that 15% or $120 million back on contract, that was producing for them almost $20 million a year. So the total contract, uh, the total value proposition that they're looking at um, from a data cleansing and governance project combined to produce just about $40 million a year in savings. And there are additional buckets of value here. Uh, many of my clients try to quantify things like, if I can't find a part, what's that mean? How much time do my engineers spend looking for materials? What if I can cut that in half? Um, so there, there's other areas that uh, I'd be happy to discuss with you at your leisure uh, about um, additional potentials for value. That leads us to our second poll question. If I could trouble you uh, to take a few seconds here and just uh, respond to, you know, when you think the best time to cleanse and govern your MRO data is within your organization. Uh, is there a key drivers that you see to be most effective? We've got three options here for you. It could be other, it could be all of the above. We see those three primary drivers for our business, mergers and acquisitions, trying to trying to combine disparate data sets to be a big challenge for a lot of organizations. And oftentimes it's one of the value propositions that you promise your shareholders. ERP upgrades. The new system's only as good as the data that goes into it, so it's an obvious time to, to cleanse your data. And many organizations, they recognize that the, the toxic data that they have in their current material systems is inhibiting their ability to do process improvement. One of my clients was trying to roll up 18 different systems on a quarterly basis because they were doing uh, enterprise-wide commodity management across 10 categories of over $500 million in spend. They were spending 80% of their time every quarter trying to rationalize that data as opposed to doing actionable uh, supply chain activities against that consistent view of data. So process improvement is, is also a very big driver for us across deduplication, reducing capital under, under management, um, you know, better strategic sourcing, on-contract spend, more efficient processes, what have you, process improvement. So, uh, I hope you have all voted by now, and uh, we will move on with the presentation. So a little bit about Verdantis. Um Basically, we call on very intensive manufacturing uh, 
customers, both in discrete and process manufacturing. We do over half our business in the energy sector. No surprise there. They're very asset intensive from both power generation to upstream, midstream, and downstream oil and gas. Um, obviously, natural resources manufacturing, food processing um, are also asset intensive manufacturing. And we have a very wide and diverse customer base from folks like United Technologies who make weapon systems, air conditioning units, jet engines, and lift systems to companies like Saudi Aramco, which is the second largest oil and gas company in the world at uh, 500 or so billion dollars who just re-upped with us for the fifth year. So very wide range. Um, food and beverage obviously has asset intensive manufacturing, so we do quite a bit of business in there. Uh, a range of different manufacturing uh, type opportunities. Um, and then, good, and then again, uh, natural resources. You know, mining has it, been an area that uh, we we spent a fair amount of time in. And some of the oil and gas kind of crosses over, especially up in Calgary, with the oil sands. That's kind of a combination of mining and oil and gas. So uh, basically, if you've got a lot of parts and assets, um, you may be a fit for us. We typically engage at above the seventy thousand uh, material count level, uh, really where we see our our, our value kicking in. So in, in summary, uh, why Verdantis, uh for uh, MRO transformation activity? Well, I'd have to say back to those three pillars, people, process, and technology. One is we have what I believe to be, and I have been doing this for a while, and I would welcomely benchmark anybody in industry, uh, industry-leading technology, the best uh, transform inconsistent toxic legacy material data through our artificial intelligence engines and unique technologies, our seasoned subject matter experts who drive that technology, and processes that we've, we've uh, fine-tuned over over 200 client engagements to make pretty much bulletproof our engagement model. So uh, we think we've done a really good job of leveraging our technology, our experience, and our processes to be able to deliver a very high percentage of extremely satisfied clients. So uh, our expertise really focuses in on, on materials. And again, we've done more work in indirect materials, but we've also done a lot of work in direct materials. I will caution you that they're very different animals. Uh, for direct materials, oftentimes you have a design engineer who wants to know everything about that material, which can include many, many attributes. I have one client who has uh, a direct material for precision castings. They have approximately 59 attributes to describe that material. When you look at indirect materials, you really look at supporting uh, use cases around search, find, and compare, not, no, not so much for design engineering. And we find on average you're really looking at about four to six attributes on top of the noun modifier to provide search, find, and compare. So much less rigorous data attribution in indirect materials, which means the value is easier to find um, from a materials governance perspective and, and cleansing perspective. Uh, we have deployed our solutions across all kinds of ERP platforms and classification structures. We are agnostic to both. So we can uh, work with any classification systems, be it custom, hybrids, EO, you know, uh, ECCN, E-Class, EOTD, UNS, DSC, uh, EOTD, uh, multiples. I have clients that have cross-referenced the same commo uh, multiple commodity codes and systems to the same material to drive different operational value buckets between, say, operations and supply chain or procurement. Um, we have a lot of experience in material services and chemicals, uh, and so why that's important is our closed loop learn by example model gets smarter the more materials you run through it. So for your average commercial off the shelf materials, services, and chemicals, we've already pre-configured and taught the tool all it needs to know to run about your data. So we're not spending a lot of time, valuable time teaching the tool about, about these things because it already knows. So again, that, that leads to faster uh, time to accurate data. 
Um, so in terms of, of, of her dentist, I, I think if you're looking at a, a proven partner in terms of these transformation projects, that's an area that, that um, we excel in, and we'd be happy to talk to you about it further. I will leave you with my contact information before I handle questions. Uh, please don't hesitate to either reach out to me or my marketing group through info at verdantis.com, um, and we'd be happy to answer any additional questions to what we get in this webinar. So I will open it up now to questions. So um, let's see what we have from our audience. Okay. Um, okay, here comes one. When should an organization consider an MRO transformation initiative? Well, we talked a little bit about that. I mean, uh, it can be process improvement driven, uh, depending on, you know, it really comes down to when, when, when can you get executive management excited about supporting a project to cleanse your, your material data or services data to drive what kind of an initiative. So that's either process improvement, uh, you know, that's, that's the result of an acquisition. Literally, one of my clients, um, Westrock, they bought Need West Vaco. Uh, the CFO walked down the hall to this, the, the, the CPO and said, you know, I just promised our shareholder $500 million in value. You get half of it. And he's looking at 18 different legacy systems with no unified view of a supply chain. So he engaged us to step in and help him give us that normalized view, and he helped deliver a good chunk of that data through uh, better uh, supply chain practices enabled in part by, by the consolidated granular view of data we gave him. So acquisitions is a big one, um, as well as upgrades. I mean, that's a logical place. If I'm consolidating or upgrading ERP systems, you know, I, I like the analogy of, I just bought this brand spanky new Ferrari. Am I really going to put diesel fuel into it? Or am I going to cleanse my data to get as best actionable reports out of my new system as I can? And I think that's the right answer. So those are really the, the areas we see as being some of the primary drivers on when you would engage on an MRO uh, transaction initiative. Um, uh, this is a good question. I didn't touch on it. Uh, the question is, uh, how does Verdantis engage its MRO tools? Uh, great question. We are a hosted technology company. Um, so when we do our harmonization process, again, we min minimize your resources for the data cleansing, but we do deploy an instance of our technology into Amazon Web Services where we do the work. We also do two touch points with our clients in that harmonized platform via that hosted instance where we do the QA review with our clients, both on uh, the data dictionary definition as well as the data results. And it, it's a very efficient tool to focus in on QA activities. So that's the, the, the touch point in which our customers will actually engage with our harmonized tool. But they don't have to learn anything because we'll be driving it. The second part is the ongoing keep it clean or governance perspective. In our case, that's the integrity tool. And that, again, is hosted by uh, Amazon Web Service. Because it's an ongoing tool, um, we integrate it with your poor ERP or asset management softwares of choice via middleware. And most of our clients' IT groups really like that because it's a handshake protocol that does not go behind your firewalls. And so from a security perspective, it's very light and clean, but very effective. So it's internet real-time synchronization. If uh, the final data steward at the enterprise level requests, uh, approves a material request to be sent to the ERP system of choice, that, that data will be sent for the remainder of the material setup process uh, via the integration. And that integration could be bi-directional. So some of our clients choose to have a more 360-degree view of their materials in the integrity tool. So they will, they will integrate uh, the transactional data of maybe things like bin location or quantity on hand or uh, you know, plant or, or other things like that, uh, min-maxes, 
uh, you know, maybe some supplier or pricing information uh, back into integrity so that when I find my part, I can answer those questions without going back into my ERP system. So those are all available and things that, that uh, we, we hammer out with our clients as part of the implementation process. One thing I will say is opposed to uh, other MDM, MMDM solutions, is we are function specific to materials and services. We go in light and fast. Um, similar to our harmonized tool, uh, it's largely pre-configured. We take the learnings from the harmonized process and we embed those into the integrity tool. So all the data dictionaries, any kind of preferred commodity coding that you want automatically assigned to a new material request, all those types of things are captured in, into the integrity tool while we're processing the data. So if you look at, I don't know, SAP MDG, and you look at a rollout plan of when I'm going to stand up my MDG uh, for materials, you're probably talking a year, maybe two. In our case, um, we are implementing the middleware integrations. We are configuring the inter integrity tool based on learnings from the harmonization process. Uh, we are typically ready for user acceptance and testing uh, two to four weeks from data delivery for the software. So it goes in very quick, uh, end user training for the integrity tool from a search find compare and request perspective is 30 to 40 minutes. That's what I mean by easy to use. It has online contact sensitive help so that if somebody does forget something, they can click on a pop-up and it'll tell them what that button does. Um, and yeah, so it's light and easy. I hope that answered the question. Bottom line, Amazon Web Service. Um, okay, here's a question about the the value proposition. the The question was around what can Verdantis do to help a client understand their case study for for a transformation in MRO project. And yeah, it's a great question. I mean, one of the things we have done, so we've been doing this for a while, is we go back to our clients and ask them, you know, about the value buckets they were trying to hit and how they quantified them. And what we've done is we've created a white paper and an Excel spreadsheet that kind of captured our learnings from our clients to kind of focus on some of the key bucket areas that, that help our clients, you know, quantify uh, savings along those those value buckets that we talked about, uh, you know, on contract spend, deduplicating my inventory, uh, better strategic sourcing, uh, more efficient search find and compare, those areas. So that's very uh, uh, very available. Um, one of the areas we can do to substantiate that is um, we often we'll do a proof of concept against a sample set of data, say 500 materials or so, where we will go through and run it through our core off the, out of the box process. Gives us a better idea of your data at hand, as well as um, you better understanding of how our process works and what, um, what the expectations should be. So, I hope that helps elaborate on that. Um, okay, next question. What key drivers are required to analyze if the value of an MRO transportation project product is worth the investment? Well, that's a great question because that dovetails into what I was talking about before. I mean, the first question is everybody, well, my experience then that most people recognize when they have, they have not spent time on cleansing their material data, that the material data is a target-rich opportunity. But nobody's going to do anything about it until they understand the business benefit or they have a good understanding of what that business benefit is going to be. So that entails that study of what that return could be against that investment. Um, and that's the area where we can help you quantify that with our uh, value proposition calculator. Uh, so by getting some key metrics together from your organization, how much material do you maintain? What's your annual, annual replenishment? How many different unique materials do you manage? Um, those types of things. We can help you 
come up with an uh, you know, industry standard or rational based on your organization uh, factors that allow us to try to quantify what we think a conservative value proposition will be. And this will change wildly um, depending on your, your history. So uh, the value equation, if you have a history of acquisitions where you didn't cleanse the data or they still have their own ERP systems, that's a target-rich opportunity. If you consolidated your ERP systems but you didn't cleanse your data, that's a target-rich opportunity. If you have process improvement initiatives and you can't get to them because your data is not consistent enough to be actionable, that's a target-rich opportunity. And we can help you quantify that. Um, our projects typically pay for themselves in well under a year. Uh, and uh, that's bulk of that time is really the data processing. Because out of that data processing, we deliver some actionable results immediately. We help you identify duplicates in three different ways. And that's like the first pass at uh, getting value out of the system. So, uh, and that again varies widely. I had one client who had grown rapidly by acquisition. Through the granular view, we gave them of their material master, uh, and it was in support of an ERP consolidation. They determined they had about 225,000 SKUs, unique SKUs. Uh, they determined that 75% of their annual replenishment was in consumables, and 40% of that was turning every week and a half, and it was duplicate. So they had a big opportunity there to reduce what they were carrying in terms of supplying that consumable commodities uh, on just an annual basis to really cut down on just what their, their overhead and inventory carrying was, just in that one value bucket. So that, that's kind of a, a, a kind of a no-brainer, if you will. I need to know what it costs. I need to know my resources required. And I need to know, to know what reasonable expectations are that I'm going to get out of this from a, a value proposition perspective. And that's stuff we can help you with. Uh, we can help you understand that. Um, so uh, please, if that's something you would like to pursue, do not hesitate to reach out. Um, I've got one last question here. Um, how long does it take to cleanse 100,000 materials? Well, uh, I can tell you there's, there's a bunch of key drivers that go into the time. One is the quantity of materials. Uh, two is the amount of enrichment we can do, and that goes back to that auto crawl slide where we go out and source data from third-party sources to give you a, a more robust description. And the third component is if there's any translation required. So the first and second parts, I mean, the second and third parts, they won't add that much time, two weeks, maybe a month. Um, 100,000 materials, you know, conservatively speaking, uh, just the core English-based uh, data processing, you're talking about 16 weeks. Um, add in the translation and enrichment, and that can go out to 20 or so weeks. And those are ballpark. We know better once we've seen the data. And also, you know, what our backlog is at any given, any given point. Um, by way of example, I delivered a project uh, last year that was close to a million materials. Uh, it did not include enrichment or translation, and we did it in a little over seven months. So the key takeaway there is that's a lot of heavy lifting in a short period of time at a very accurate level. So what's that mean? It means we delivered a successful project. It means it came in while you know, management structure was still in place. We still had our executive sponsor. Uh, they were able to deliver and, and start creating actions against those materials. Um, but yeah, we can, we can tackle some of the more, more robust projects out there. Uh, I mentioned Aramco earlier. We did over 2 million materials for them, and they're using our technology to onboard 40,000 suppliers into a buy side catalog. Uh, we've done projects like Siemens Water. That was 1.3 million materials across uh, close to 20 legacy systems in 23 different languages, and we delivered that in about 11 months. So 
my point being is for a domain-specific small company, we have architected ourselves around people, process, and technology that allow us to handle some of the most complex as well as the most routine uh, MRO data transformation projects in industry. Um, by way of example, in our earlier days, we were, pro we were part of Project Harden, which is a which was the largest SAP implementation at Cargill in the world, and that was about 10 million materials. So, our range of engagement is between about 70,000 materials to eight figures in terms of uh, where where we deliver. So we're industrial strength in terms of uh, MRO transformation projects. At the lower end of the scale, the key foods, about 80,000 materials. Uh, you know, I think that was about 14 weeks, 12, 14 weeks um, in terms of uh, process. So that, that, that should give you a better idea of the amount of time required. So I see we're coming up to the top of the hour. If there's any further questions, please do send them in to me or my marketing team at info at verdantis.com. I want to thank you very much for your time today, and uh, I hope you uh, find MRO Transformation Webinar to be useful for you. This was a fairly high-level pass. We would be happy to uh, provide you more detail on both what we do as well as how we see the industry and where we find the challenges and opportunities. So, again, thank you so much for your time, and uh, have a great day. Thank you so much.